This is Star Talk Cosmic Queries Edition. And you know that means I got Chuck Nice right here. Hey, Chuck. Hey, Neil. What's happening? You know who our guest is for Cosmic Queries this time? It's, uh, it's good old Dr. Funky Spoon. Dr. David Grinspoon. Funky Spoon. Oh, oh, yeah. What? He's a, he's a get resident. The, get the <laughs> funk out of my face. Get the funk out of my face. <laughs> he's our at large astrobiologist and musician and uh, uh, the man who's just all about the solar system and so we solicited questions from our fan base that are right in his wheelhouse and I have maybe five percent overlap with that wheelhouse so that means we'll be deferring to David Grinswood. David welcome back to Star Talk. Hey guys thank you it's it's great to be here great to see you both. Yeah we count you as a friend you've been on many many times and uh, you're, on your resume here, I've got you a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, and that's in Arizona. Is that correct? That's in Arizona. I'm in uh, the Washington, D.C. area through the, the magic of, uh, of the interwebs uh, where PSI, Planetary Science Institute, is sort of distributed. We have people all over the place. And uh, once a year, we get together in person, uh, just like the old days. But Just to verify that you, you're not just bots. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or if we are, if we are, we're very sophisticated, convincing ones. <laughs> and I'm reminded you're author of Chasing New Horizons. I see what you did there because there is a mission to Pluto called New Horizons. Mm -hmm. And it's well inside the epic first mission to Pluto. Now, Chuck, you see what he did there? He's very... Mm -hmm. Uh, expectant that there'll be more missions to Pluto. <laughs> right, right. Uh, by the way, the um, the uh, subtitle of that uh, New Horizons was uh, "Screw You, Neil." Uh, that, <laughs> that was uh, that was the. Uh, <laughs> I see. I was implicated no, no, in the no, motion of Pluto. Chuck, Chuck, that's the implied subtitle. Come on. Uh, oh, okay. oh, the okay. actual oh, subtitle. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but let's not forget about uh, my favorite Doctor Funky Spoon book, if I recall correctly, uh, is Earth in Human Hands, because it's all about how we are shaping this planet. And uh, if you want to know some great information about climate change and the uh, Anthropocene, uh, you should check out that book, man, because it's uh, it helped me. It's really very cool. Wow, I didn't know you're now his agent. Okay, <laughs> uh, good to know that. Uh, so. No, Chuck, Chuck's Chuck's just my 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 like prime audience. If 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 he likes oh, it, right. then then I know I did something right. So. Well, well, tell us about tell us about that book, because if you're if you're a planetary expert, then Earth is simply another planet. And then you get to compare it, but uh, you know this its strengths Whoa, and weaknesses, and susceptibilities. He does that in the book, actually. <laughs> That's what I meant. So I just want you to, to, to let's take me there for a few. Yeah. Minutes, well, please. so so I I just thought it would be I thought it would be cool to uh, look at um, sort of the question of you know the perennial question of what are humans and what makes us different, if anything. Mm. It's almost the uh, the astrobiologist view of you know if you were an alien with a long attention span watching earth and then in this recent stretch of time you would have seen something really weird happen to our planet that has never happened to it before you know where the night side lights up and the atmosphere changes and every, everything changes and and what does that sort of look like from a planetary perspective that was sort of the goal of uh, earth in human hands okay cool cool and when, when was that published that was published in uh, 2017 2017 and the date on the new horizons book that was um, 2018. That was a busy little stretch for me. Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm very... still recovering <laughs> from all that. <laughs> very, very cool. And uh, we also have you listed here as a musician. Are you active or are you just sort of play at home where no one's listening? Well, actually, one of the things that's wonderful for me and I think for a lot of people about this stage where the pandemic maybe isn't over but is easing up a little bit is the return of live music and mm -hmm. i've been really enjoying that both as a listener and fan and also as a performer and i have been playing i'm uh, i'm in a new band actually here in the dc area we're called the easy way and it's kind of a funk soul uh okay. thing and it's uh we've just started playing we played we played four gigs now so that's that's really fun for me is to be back out playing a little music and are, are there any other scientists in the in the band with you there are actually, uh, well, 
No, but uh, one one of the other guys that our lead singer, he works at NASA. He's not a scientist, but he's okay. a NASA dude. So, so we do. NASA does represent. <laughs> so, so Chuck, you got questions for us? I haven't seen them yet. I don't know if if David has. Uh, uh, I'm sure. I, uh, I listen. I haven't. So guess okay. what? Okay. All right. So <laughs> I don't think anybody has. This, uh, this is a cosmic query. So tell us yes. what you got. Here we go. You want to jump into this? Let's do it. Let's uh, let's pop things off with Trevor C. Mills. Trevor says, "Hey, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Grinspoon, as well as Chuck. Uh, I hope this finds you well. This is Trevor from Augusta, Georgia. At what point in our search for extraterrestrial life do we start?" A, church, a search for non-carbon based life and where's like the that. good candidates aside mm. from silicone mm. so okay i yeah, like that good question you know yeah, you the thing is i would say there's not one specific point it's almost like more a perspective we have to keep in mind and re and remember that this search needs to be conducted with the the humility of the realization that we don't really know what we're looking for. We have some hunches about what's universal uh, about life. And we know that carbon chemistry in water is a basis that can work. And we have uh, good reason to believe that that could be functioning elsewhere because the conditions are uh, are available for it other places. So so it's a good thing to look for because we we know it can work and we know we sort of know how to look for it. but. Um, we should keep in mind that we don't have any solid reason to believe that that's the only kind of life. We haven't thought of any other. Nobody's constructed or or invented in a lab another kind of life that works as well. But that just that could be because we're dumb, not because the universe doesn't know no, how to do it. We do it in it, our right? movies. Our movies, we do it a hundred times over. Right? That, yeah, it happens in movies. Mm -hmm. and, and and you know there is this move in NASA astrobiology um, to look for what we call agnostic biosignatures which means uh, not assume, trying to assume as little as possible and looking for sort of more universal things that may not depend on carbon, you know? It, it, but then you get into this question, what do we even mean by life? And, and what does life do? But you could talk about, um, you know, chemical disequilibrium, life changing the chemical balance of its environment in a way that non-life probably doesn't. And if you, go that route, it doesn't have to be carbon based. It just has to be something that's multiplying itself and and uh, using energy. And so so we do have ideas about how to look for non carbon based life. And and I think we it's good to be reminded. So so thank you <laughs> for the reminder that we should keep keep that in mind as we search. But our search does tend to be focused on quote life as we know it, partly because that's what we know how to look for. So often people will swap try to swap silicon in for carbon in the molecule and many sci-fi sci-fi movies that have attempted other chemically based life have done that with silicon and can you tell me why silicon would be such a attractive yeah. next next option yeah because in some ways silicon um is a lot like carbon in that you know if you look at the periodic table we all remember the periodic table from the wall of our, our uh, science classroom. And it's got, you know, in the upper left, it's got hydrogen. And then below hydrogen are all the things that bond like hydrogen with like one electron. And sort of in the middle of that chart is carbon at the top. And then below it are all the things that bond like carbon. Carbon makes four bonds with other things. And that's the basis of, of organic chemistry, which is the basis of life. So you look right below carbon, the next thing down is silicon you think okay silicon that's going to be kind of like carbon maybe you, you can make biomolecules out of that so there's a good logic to it but the problem is uh silicon bonds are not like carbon bonds uh, what's great about carbon is not just that it bonds to four other things so it can make this whole you know um complex uh, lego set of of well, molecules I mean, it does, then it doesn't sound like it it, it 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 works it doesn't sound like it it sounds like it's people making a leap because it's similarities but yeah. that's like me saying you know obama has large ears he's black i could be president you know <laughs> no no chuck no you can't you cannot it, okay it is, kind of, it is kind of like that it depends on what what features no, you're don't, focusing don't, on don't agree with chuck on that don't well don't no get, but get i mean <laughs> no. I'm, I'm sorry neil but chuck has a point here it you're, depends you're on no what characteristics you're focusing with chuck on. on this show <laughs> and the fact that the fact that silicon bonds to four of the things makes it like carbon but the problem is the nature of those bonds 
carbon bonds are also kind of floppy and loose and can, you know, carbon can get into all these like weird configurations, which make proteins and things. Silicon bonds tend to be really stiff and, wow. you know, they don't make those nice uh, complex configurations the way carbon bonds do. So For those who can't see, David Greenstone was just voguing he in the last <laughs> few moments. <laughs> shaping his hands around his face. Chemical voguing. Imitating the flexibility or rigidity of yeah. carbon and silicon Carbon? Bonds. Yeah. Strike a pose. Silicon. Silicon. <laughs> <laughs> silicon right. likes to silicon likes to strike a pose and stick to it yeah right. okay yeah. gotcha and and so that's less flexible when life is experimenting on the diversity of what it may need to thrive in an environment is that a fair yeah. statement and I, and i don't think it makes like carbon makes polymers you know the big molecules where it's not just carbon but it's attached to lots of other things silicon it makes you know silicon oxygen chains and things like that but i don't think it makes the kind of just diverse molecule set that makes carbon so good for life. Uh, I would add, just from an astrophysical point of view, there's like five times as much carbon in the universe as there is silicon. So you don't even need to appeal to silicon because carbon is there for you and it's your friend. Hmm. So to both of you, with respect to this, is are there any conditions in the universe under which circumstances cause different reactions to these elements where they might behave in such a way to do something like make life? Or is the periodic chart the same no matter what, no matter where? Mm. Well, the periodic chart is going to be the same. Uh, no, I'm I mean the elements, not the chart. I'm talking no, about but I mean, but, but I mean, the elements are going to be the same. But your question is good. Are there conditions in which the reaction types, the behavior... Is going to be different and, and the answer is yes there are conditions in which it's different and that's why we have to be careful to not be too earth centric but uh -huh. has anybody come up with a set of conditions that we're likely to find somewhere where you can show that silicon is going to do the right thing to make life the answer is no but that may be just again be a limit on our imagination okay as any as any good scientist you gotta sort of not only know your limits but be prepared to shatter them as you as you take every next step uh, going All forward. Right. Chuck, you got another question for All the, right, the here Funky we... Spoon here? Yep, yep, yep. This is uh, Emily, either Talus or Talius, one or the other, because uh, there's a double L. So uh, hi, Chuck and Neil. Greetings from Paris, France. So maybe not either one of those in pronunciations. I know, you probably... <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. And then she goes, uh, oh, look at this. Chuck, feel free to butcher my name. I can't wait to hear what you come up with. Oh, oh people setting you up. God, jeez. Oh. That was good okay. pre preempt preemptive uh, consideration. Yeah, tell me about it. Wow. All right, she goes, I was wondering what would happen if we were to discover intelligent life outside of Earth, of course, but less advanced than we are. First, how would we discover it and confirm that it is indeed less intelligent? Well, that's pretty easy. And second, once confirmed, what would the next steps be? Is there a protocol for life discovery? Mm. I, yeah, first of all, I love the question, and it's not one we think about very much because there's a set of assumptions um, that are almost unspoken because of how long we've been assuming them and how frequently we assume them. Which... Actually, David, they'll remain unspoken until we come back from this break. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they will remain wow, unspoken a little longer. <laughs> oh, just a little longer. Just a little longer. Let's find out about the unspoken protocol. That's the next uh, installment of, of Mission Impossible. David's unspoken protocol about <laughs> encountering life. Uh, we'll be right back after this first break. We're back. Star Talk. Cosmic Queries with David Grinspoon, a friend and colleague, and he's an expert on the solar system and astrobiology and all kinds of cool things such as that. Uh, David, how do we find you on social media? Uh, well, I'm I'm still on Twitter, uh, at least today, <laughs> oh. and that's that's um, <laughs> at Dr. Funky Spoon. Um, Doctor, that's why we call you that, Doctor Funky Spoon. Yeah, yeah and okay. I'm on I'm I'm on uh, Facebook just under my name and and. Uh, I'm on Mastodon now too, uh, which is I'm Dr. Ooh. Funk Spoon at Koto.org, Q O T O. Funky or Funk Spoon? Funky, F U N K Y. Funky. Oh, funky, funky Spoon. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, on Mastodon. All I'm right. hedging my bets. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. So, Chuck, we left off with a question about what would from, happen. From Emily Talia. Tal yes, Tal well, well, she's from France. So it's em Emily? Emily? That's right. Emily. 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 Uh, I mean, how, you, Emily. how do you Frenchify, yes, Frenchophile you, uh, uh, Emily? But yeah. so, so she wants to know what happens when we find life that's less intelligent than us. Right. That's hardly ever addressed in right. sci-fi storytelling. Yeah. Because or, no one could imagine yeah. that we could be smarter. Well, it's hardly <laughs> ever addressed in... else in the universe. <laughs> yeah. It's hardly ever addressed in sci-fi, but it's also hardly ever uh, addressed in, um, in SETI itself because there's always this assumption that anybody we find is going to almost surely be more, quote, advanced than us or have been around as a technological species or civilization much longer. And th there's a good logic for that because, you know, on this, for one thing on a cosmic time scale, we're just babies, right? You know, four and a half billion years of earth, four billion years of life, depending on where you, you start it, you know, a couple million years of being human and a, a few hundred years of being technological and less than a hundred years or a hundred years of being radio friendly you know so so we're babies and so that's one thing just time scale wise but also anybody who's good at interstellar communication or certainly anybody who's traveling um in an interstellar scale is almost surely uh has technology that we haven't developed yet you know so there's there's good logic there so we always imagine that we are the neophytes and they're the wise ones and that there's an asymmetry in contact in that direction and you know statistically i think it's a pretty good argument but it's an interesting question what if we meet somebody who's uh you know it, 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 there's a pretty narrow range there where they could be dumber than us and still considered <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> still considered intelligent but what if we right. what if we did and and yeah and how would we find them because presumably then they wouldn't have traveled here so right. we'd have to stumble or, or upon responded them. or responded right so even even if they're not traveling yeah. here yeah but what if so. we got you know what so what if we got lucky and sort of stumbled on a civilization that was sort of just becoming technological but hadn't become interstellar yet um it seems no, that would just be a tech level that's not an intelligence level no that's a good right? point too because right. because right. you could argue there's you know there's always the whales right <laughs> and the dolphins oh. they're really intelligent they arguably have a civilization and a I culture i saw that star trek movie the same yeah. whales yes. star trek movie yes yeah yeah so we could certainly find intelligent life that is not uh technological at the level we are um and you know as far as protocols it's there's it's pretty vague you know there are protocols for seti if we think we found something a radio signal what SETI, do you do the search for extraterrestrial intelligence just the general yeah a term for that right mm -hmm. yeah so so the the seti the search for extraterrestrial intelligence community has protocols that if somebody thinks they found a signal then you don't announce it immediately to the public first you verify it and you get another observatory to also find it. So you make sure it's not some weird mistake that your observatory is making and some local interference. But then once you're sure, um, then the the protocol is complete transparency. You alert everybody, you know. So uh, you're unless the men in black get to you first. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> With a flashy thing. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, you know, and then if, if somebody comes, you know, and lands a spaceship on Earth uh, and contacts us, we, there's no real official protocol for that because it's not something that's just been, uh, you know, you can argue whether it should be or shouldn't be, but it hasn't really been taken seriously enough by the, the sort of SETI and scientific community to develop a protocol for that. All I know is that in today's world, if the aliens land and they say, take us to your leader, nobody's taking them to the white house <laughs> yeah that's so true it would we'll really take them, get it would, a beer it would present a conundrum where do you take them <laughs> yeah, yeah you take them get a beer at the corner pub <laughs> i imagine that my my fantasy is that they would land and then we find out that we're so insignificant that they're actually filming a reality show oh oh with them among us yes exactly yeah, okay right. <laughs> like that is the, that's what we rate as like, hey, let's go down there and like, like basically they're the Aston Kutcher of the universe and we're the ones that are being pranked. You we're, know? Pro we're basically props. We're props. 
we're, we're straight up props. So, David, I just want to add that if we count chimps as sort of the next smartest species to us, just, just for the sake of this, for this example, we can't have a meaningful conversation with them. Think about it. Huh. And we've got 99% right. identical DNA. So if, if we find another species that's sort of not as smart as us, what evidence do we have that we'd be able to communicate with them or worse yet, finding a species just that 1% smarter than us than we are to chimps, what hope do we have of them even being able to communicate with us because our simplest thoughts would transcend our most brilliant thinkers? Yeah, your, your example of chimps really uh, is an interesting one. And it kind of illustrates that something very recent has happened uh, here on Earth with humans that uh, for better or worse, where we have the, these qualities of of language and culture and and so forth and you know not just i mean chimps you can argue have a kind of language but the sort of syntactical language and ability to express abstract thoughts and all that maybe you know it's pretty it's pretty new and it underscores how unlikely it probably is that we would connect with somebody else out there who seemed like an intelligent uh civilization uh but also was less um capable than us because you know it, it really illustrates that maybe we've just passed some kind of a threshold and on the other direction yeah so what if somebody is to us as we are to chimps that may be possible but it may also be that this sort of threshold is something that once you're over it then maybe you sort of can communicate even if you recognize that these guys are geniuses compared to us uh, it's an so interesting that's question that, that's david's human ego that just got into that <laughs> yeah, we, we, we hit that threshold and we could communicate with any intelligent species smarter than us. Right. Yeah, keep yeah. thinking that, David. Yeah. I said maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe, uh, we're, uh, maybe we're dumb as rocks compared to just about everybody Thank in you. the universe. I like that one. That's mine. Thank That's you. the one right, I like. There you go. <laughs> All right, Chuck, Just, keep them coming. All right. This is Sandra Pagliani. Sandra Pagliani says... Good morning or evening, wonderful Star Talk hosts and listeners. This one came to me as I was flying to Seattle and looking out the window. Love it. Love looking out the window. Yeah. Why are black holes generally situated in the center of galaxies? Why that specific area? And yes, this is the kind of stuff that I think about while I'm on planes looking out the window. That's good. Because a whole lot of other yeah. stuff you can think about that create anxiety and things. Yeah. And if you can think about black holes on a plane and not feel anxious, that's that's good. Right. So, uh, so, David, I should probably take this one, right? Yeah, I was going to say that uh, we, we actually have an astrophysicist here, and it's not me. <laughs> uh, so a black hole, our understanding of black holes tells us that uh, you can get it from the death of a very high-mass star. The sun is not among them. And high-mass stars are very rare. So these would be stars that are dotted around the galaxy from uh, black holes that is the remnant of a supermassive star that lived out its life and died. And in the final collapse, it collapsed all the way to a black hole. We expect those black holes to be pretty much rare, but everywhere, if, if, you, can, if you can picture that. So, so in other words, wherever you had stars being born, you'd have like maybe one of these, all right? So there are fewer of them than all the total stars by far, but there's no part of the galaxy that would be without them. So that's for start. So that's a one kind. That those are called uh, stellar black holes. Then, just empirically, we discovered that the centers of galaxies have black holes in them. We just it was a discovery in my life while I was in graduate school. This discovery took root, and we say, well, we've got one in our galaxy and one in the, a nearby galaxy, and in a, well, there's another galaxy over here. We we can get data and we show a black hole. And so we extrapolated. We said, if it's in these three galaxies, it must be in all galaxies. <laughs> it's hard enough yeah. to get those data. <laughs> and those galaxies were very different from each other. So then we just went on the assumption that every big galaxy would have a supermassive black hole. And sure enough, Hubble telescope gets launched, and every galaxy we look into and have the quality of data to know, they've all got a supermassive black hole. And we do not yet know how they were formed. And the James Webb Space Telescope is exquisitely tuned to see the birth of galaxies and from those data we might be able to see material collecting in the middle to form the supermassive black holes that dot the center of every galaxy 
And to get a sense of it, a black hole, um, stellar black hole might be five, ten times the mass of the sun. But the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies is hundreds of thousands up to millions of times the mass of the sun. So if it's consistent that it's the death of a star that makes that, do we see stars that have that mass in the universe that might be able to create the supermassive black hole that coalesces a galaxy? Do no. See no. Okay. Yeah, stars give out at about 60 to 100 times the mass of the sun. We don't find stars more heavier than that. So we're okay. not going to find a billion times mass of the sun star. Right. We just have never seen that. And okay. so that's what we think something else is making them. That's, that's it. Has something else there. That's that, that, something else. That is, wow, that is a wonderful mystery. Yeah, yeah. Mystery. Well, the universe brims with mysteries. That's why David and I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 lo I love the fact that for the supermassive black hole it, it, in our own galaxy, we can actually watch the stars orbiting it. So and, and a Nobel Prize winning observations. Uh, yes, we can. You, you're watching these stars do these loops and loops, and there's nothing there in the middle. Nothing. Right. Nothing. It's, en yeah. it's enough to make you really believe. <laughs> <laughs> That's and you great. run the math on the orbits and the speeds and the, and the distances, and you get a black hole. You get a it's black hole. Simple. Yeah. It's, it's not, so it's, cool. It's not a NASCAR track. It's a nope. black hole. <laughs> That's very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. Um, this is, his name is on another page, Gavin Mallow. And Gavin says, greetings from Beaver Creek. Hello, David, Neil, and Chuck. And that's Beaver Creek, Ohio. I forgot the Ohio part. Okay. I'm curious about the possibility of life on an Earth-like planet that would lack the protective sleeve that Earth's atmosphere and magnetic fields supply us. What would life do to accommodate these relative extreme conditions? Could Ooh. anything on Earth potentially be transmissible to an environment as such? Ooh, ha ha. I like that. I like that. Yeah. yeah, David, we got these, we got these protect, you know, we, our, our atmosphere protects us from meteors, it protects us from UV light, it's, you know, so we're here uh, by the grace of the atmosphere, and so if there's a planet out there, Earth size, Earth gravity, Goldilocks zone maybe, and doesn't have these protecting forces, what, what do we do? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'm, I'm less worried about the magnetic field part, which is the other... Thing that the questioner asked because we're learning more that makes us wonder how important magnetic fields are in protecting the surface of a planet uh we, we used to say that without that it was the lack of a magnetic field that made mars lose its atmosphere for instance but more recent observations have made us question that and the role of a magnetic field in protecting the atmosphere itself is not so clear and then there's the example of of one of my favorite planets venus which has no intrinsic magnetic field, but because it has a thick atmosphere, it's still protected. In fact, Venus develops what's called an induced magnetic field, where just the, the solar wind itself sort of makes the upper atmosphere charged in such a way that it starts acting like it has a magnetic field. And David, so, if memory serves, you wrote a book on Venus too. This is correct, yes. Wait, wait, you, sorry, you wrote a book on Earth about Venus. <laughs> That's right. I was not on Venus when I wrote the book, but I wrote a book on the subject of Venus. And the title so, of that book was what? That, that's Venus Revealed. Revealed. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Good. So you've been yeah. at this for a while. Very good. Yeah, yeah. So, so magnetic fields, I think life could, life would find a way. But, um, but an atmosphere fills so many roles. Not only does it protect from dangerous radiation, ultraviolet light and cosmic rays. But of course, it also um, serves to transport, um, you know, think of Earth and the, the role of oxygen and carbon dioxide in plant and animal life, the transporting of um, chemicals that are involved in, in the metabolism of organisms, of, uh, you know, trading energy between molecules and so forth. It's hard to imagine life evolving on the surface of a planet without an atmosphere now of course there are places in the solar system without atmospheres where we think there might be life on the inside like say europa and so one could imagine an earth-like planet w without an atmosphere that still had the chemical stuff happening and the, and the and the energy transformations on the inside so that maybe you'd have internal life um it, 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 it in in the interior of the planet mm -hmm. but 
but it, but an atmosphere is so integral to the kind of life that we have on earth that it really sort of stretches the imagination to to think of how you would get a biosphere without an atmosphere and 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 there's nothing wrong with stretching the imagination i mean let it be this so. is true let that's why we like these kinds of questions yeah 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 chuck we got to take a quick break okay and david will be back in just a moment for our third and final segment with david grinspoon on star talk we're back star talk cosmic queries all about the solar system and searching for life and astrobiology with one of the world's leading experts on these very subjects, David Grinspoon, a friend and colleague at the Planetary Science Institute, itself based in Arizona, but he is distributed. Uh, he's part of the uh, uh, PSI at large community based in Washington, D.C. Always good to have you, David. You're a friend of our show. And thanks for responding to our Always call. great to be here with you guys. Yeah. Let's make this kind of like a lightning round. All right. And we'll speed it okay. up as we go along. Because we only okay, got through we... like five questions, and we got more, to tons of them. Let's keep going. All right, here we go. Eric Sharakan, or Sharakan, says, uh, hey, from Boston, what does Dr. David Grinspoon think about the James Webb Space Telescope's recent exoplanet discovery, particularly that it appears similar to Earth in size and in comfort? position yeah david you know when we designed the damn telescope it was to look for galaxies at the edge of the universe and then you planet people are starting to use it to like look at stuff right in front of our noses so who went what in the dark of what night did that <laughs> did that yeah. do you know folio who do start... you know that you were able to pull <laughs> how, this how, off when did that happen yeah all right. Well, first of all, Boston, my hometown. Yay, go Celtics! And um, the uh, it's it's wonderful. What what I think of that is, uh, you know, like uh, as Neil implies, <laughs> the 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 web was not designed to uh, look at exoplanets. It was designed for uh, galaxies and uh, other things like that, astrophysical targets. But um, you know, I chalk it up to the fact that the universe is just so incredibly productive when it comes to planets much more than we thought even when people started designing the web and so it in a way it's luck you know there turns out uh, web is sort of marginal for exoplanets but there's so many good targets that we're starting to find them and the the exciting prospect now is that we can start to see what their atmospheres are made of e even though again web is not the ideal instrument for that and we've got other ones of course we want to build in the future that will be more ideal. We're we're going to learn some really cool and important things about our our planets in uh, in nearby star systems, and that's so you're being just opportunistic, uh, and that that's good. Absolutely, that's a good, thing. good thing. Absolutely. All right, yes. Chuck, keep it coming. All right, that's let's good, just nice, keep going. Succinct answer, David. We'll, okay, we'll through this it, we'll, third round. Okay, go. Keep it moving. Kyle Marston says, "Hey yo, hey yo, hey." I didn't say that. He did. Uh, how, how many Earth-like planets do we know about currently that reside in habitable orbits? Is there a number? Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of marginal ones. Uh, I would say um, I would say a handful. You know, um, which is which is pretty good because when you come when it comes to saying habitable orbits, some of them we're sort of guessing because it really depends on whether they have an atmosphere or not and what the details of their climates. But there's a you know there's a good uh, dozen or so that um, seem like pretty good Wait, candidates. David, there are five thousand planets in the catalog right now, and you tell me there's only like a dozen that are Goldilocks planets. I'm saying ones that we and it depends what you mean by Earth-like. Okay. These are these are all gray area okay, terms, okay. but I'm saying I'm saying roughly Earth sized and definitely uh, good candidates to be in the habitable zone and maybe have liquid oceans and things like that. It's a small but growing number. OK. All right. So that would be if we did it in percentages, it, what's 10 out of 5000. So what is that? It's one out of 500. So that's still pretty low. It's like a, a fifth of one percent. Right? Yeah. But, you know, but a lot of those 5000 are ones that that will could be these are I, I i'm given a conservative number for ones that we can say yes that's earth sized got, and got, yes that is so there's really some in, the, in the running in the running and we don't absolutely okay. but it's Good. still big news it's still big news when we find one yeah that's why it's so exciting that you know it's this one that was just mentioned because like oh yeah that's earth sized and it seems to be in the habitable zone that's it's still news <laughs> yes yes which is a good thing. It means that people are still oh, yeah. excited and there aren't en yeah. enough of them to get bored with it yet. Okay. <laughs> Chuck, keep it coming. 
All righty, here we go. This is Zeki Masjed. I I think. I mean, it, you, you, maybe. You're the, you're the reader here, so yeah, it's so always Zeki, what you think. Zeki Masjed. Okay, you're right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you the truth. I really don't think that, but that's about <laughs> as close as I can come, okay? Uh, he says... Hey, Neil. Hey, David. And Seth MacFarlane's The Orville 25th Century Life has progressed far into the galaxy, solved societal, health, and technological issues, and eliminated money as a form of currency. Do you think this future is viable? And what steps do present-day humans need to take individually as well as on a larger scale to walk towards that goal? How can we push for science literacy globally? Wow. Okay. Mm. So David, answer that in three sentences, if you can. <laughs> uh, I, I would say in three sentences, yes, I think it's possible, though not assured. Um, and that the path is not going to be smooth <laughs> between here and there. And that the the key is um, some sort of a globally enlightened um, society where we uh, guide ourselves with the recognition that we are one planetary species, uh, despite all of our wonderful differences. Just as a guiding okay. uh, force operating on our future decisions. Yeah. Right. Well, there you go. Here's your answer. You, we're screwed. <laughs> we're screwed. No, no. <laughs> okay. And I think just to, just to remind people, I think the original Star Trek, after which so much of the Orville is, uh, so much of it in, is inspired forces operating within the storytelling of Orville, uh, if I remember correctly, the reason why there's no money is because they, they someone developed a replicator, where you if you need another one of something, you just make another one in it. So you didn't have to go out and buy it or earn money to obtain it. Yeah. So it's post post scarcity. <laughs> yeah, correct, a post scarcity world, right? Where anything could just come yeah. out of a box, a, a machine right. that yeah. you you create, and so that changes what people care about, what they yeah. value, and all the rest. But one of them is you don't need money. It's so, interesting because mon money is just a belief system any anyways. We all fool ourselves into thinking it has value. So it does have value. Right, so right. we could always change our minds collectively about that. Right, right, right. right. Uh, and the other thing, too, is once they got rid of money, they people started to do what they wanted to do, which so you naturally end up with a passion for life because everybody's doing what they want to do. Rather than what they have to do in order Why to do, pay the rent. Exactly. Wow. Okay, but then that, how do you explain Ferengis? Well, well <laughs> yeah, they're greedy little bastards. That's how you explain them. They're just greedy little bastards. They, they don't care. They have it all, and they still want more. You know. But, but Chuck, what you said is deep because it it what it would do it would liberate the creativity of every citizen of the world, right? To yeah. contribute in whatever way best floats their boat. And they'll probably be better at that than anything else they would have done, right? Because they'll do it because they right, want to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they have to. Yeah. Deep, deep thoughts. I like there, it. Chuck. I like it. I think. I think we should just like start that world right now. Oh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great. <laughs> and on January seventeenth, twenty twenty-three, a revolution took hold and spread like wildfire across the face of the globe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is Cameron Bellamy who says, greetings from Baltimore, Maryland. What aspects of a planet's climate are planetary scientists looking for when evaluating planets for potential to support life? Additionally, how close do these planets need to be to Earth to look for these aspects in the planet's climate? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, 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 it's a good question. So, I mean, the basic factor that we're always very focused on is a climate in the range where water would be predominantly liquid and again that could just be our own bias because uh, you know as we talked about it earlier maybe we're not smart enough to think of other kinds of life that don't need water but earth so much of what makes earth the way it is is because the climate balance is such that we live on a water planet and that is in every cell of your body is liquid water interacting with organic molecules. So, so that's the number one thing. There's enough greenhouse gases, um, in a good carbon way. dioxide. In yeah, a good exactly. Way. The the a good amount of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water, a little methane, sulfur dioxide. These are the gases that absorb infrared radiation and make a planet warm. But not so much that you have a Venus that's just too hot for liquid water. So that that's the the sort of prime directive, if you will, for, for habitability. 
Um, and what was the second part of the question? Um, what do we look for um, to... Um, oh, how far away? How, how far, far away? away? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, you know, with the tools we have now, we can... There's... It's it's very difficult to um, tell what's in a planet's atmosphere unless it's not just distance. The geometry has to be right. If we have what we call a transiting planet, so it passes in its orbit right between us and its star, then you can look at the radiation coming from that star as it passes through the atmosphere and see how it's filtered out and what molecules are there. But it's easier to do that if you're you know within a few hundred light years than if you're thousands of light years. Holy but, crap. But if we, as we get better instruments um, that we want to build in the future, we'll be able to greatly expand the number of planets we can do that for. Uh, just a quick addition here. I remember watching Star Trek, and just you ever notice, David, Chuck, they never wore spacesuits when they went down to planet surfaces. Right. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they never wore because they, uh, some, at some point, the Spock would say, uh, it's a uh, oxygen nitrogen atmosphere, Captain. Uh, right. And so it's then a they class go down and planet, they just breathe Captain. It. And, right. and, but I would yeah. hear that, and it was as though all we have to do is find an oxygen nitrogen planet to move to. And then I realized, and David, correct me if I'm wrong here, if it has oxygen, something's making the oxygen. So, so you are already looking for planets that had some kind of life forms on it to create that atmosphere in the first place. It's not that there's all kinds of random atmospheres that exist on all the planets and pick the ones that you happen to be able to breathe. There's, there's active stuff going on there. Is that fair? Yeah, the reason, why, the reason why we have a breathable atmosphere is because there's life here. Right. <laughs> oh, wow, and that. so any planet you find with that kind of atmosphere would be very surprising. Uh, like like you say, Neil, what, what what else would be making an atmosphere with just that mixture? It's hard to imagine that it's not right. brimming with life. Right, right, right. So cool. Okay, a couple more. Chuck, man, we're blowing uh, through these. Very nice. Right. Yes, we are. Okay. Yes, we are. Here we are. Uh, this is um, Fred. Now, now we're, we're, we got to speed up even more. So, David, soundbite mode, okay? Remember, they, uh, so ABC News just put a microphone in front of your lips, and they're going to soundbite you for the evening news. So here it is. Go, Chuck. <laughs> All right. Uh Hello, Chuck. Hello, Neil. Hello, Dr. Funky Spoon. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> Does weed still work in space? Or are the THC crystals too fragile for space? What temperature, uh, what hemp crop would be gr best to grow on Mars? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I don't know that the experiment's ever been tried, but in all seriousness, one thing I wonder about you told me is NASA never took weed into the space station. Oh, not that I, not that I know of. But okay. I, I will say, in all seriousness, one of the big problems with astronaut health is eye pressure, ocular pressure, and one of the things that is well established that cannabis does yep. medically is, is good for glaucoma because right. it reduces ocular pressure. So I've always thought, and I've kind of whispered this to a few people at NASA, but like, <laughs> why don't you try that? <laughs> right on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to smoke it. We have gummies. Exactly. And tell me about the soils of Mars. Can you grow anything there? Yeah. I mean, if you could grow, uh, anything i mean the thing uh, you know cannabis is just another plant so if you grow tomatoes you're going to be able to grow cannabis there it's okay. uh, so whatever the soil the soil by itself as of now probably isn't very uh isn't very fertile you know because it doesn't it doesn't have organics from the, from the book and movie the martian yeah to, but to, it could certainly poop, you could certainly mix in a mix in a little of either human generated or otherwise generated fertilizer and grow stuff on mars <laughs> <laughs> yeah. human generated fertilizer fertilizer right on. <laughs> yeah. yeah i always That's knew you not... were full of fertilizer exactly. yeah. not not the we call that kind. hgf <laughs> nice nice one last right. one chuck this here we, we go for. this is uh akshat Pat oh man why does it take you as long to read the name as the question itself because i don't prepare Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Patikar, that's it. Ashkat Patikar, who says this. Hey, fr hello and greetings from India. I was wondering whether Venus was once a habitable planet and their civilization was there uh, living on the planet, but unfortunately they destroyed themselves due to extreme climate change. Oh! <laughs> oh! 
<laughs> what does yes. the chronic history have to say about the evolution of the entire planet? Thanks, and I love the show. Oh, um, and this is, from, when, this is from India. Just let me give from a shout-out. Yeah. India yeah. India yes, been growing their presence in space with satellites and space missions and things. Yeah, and, and they have a Venus mission that's announced, an Indian Venus mission that's going to be. Maybe where that be. came from. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. But, so, um, so, welcome so, to the company of spacefaring nations. Short say, answer. I've often, of I, yes, indeed. A short answer. I've often wondered that myself, but it's true that we think that Venus probably was habitable, although that's one of the motivations for our upcoming missions is to determine, was it really? We think it had oceans and lost them, but we want to gather the evidence to be sure of that. Um, we de generally don't talk about an ancient civilization on Venus, although one has to admit that we have not explored the planet well enough to rule that out. Okay. Wait, wait, you said you don't talk about it. That implies you don't talk about it in public or something. No, no, you no. I didn't... said that, Chuck. Yeah, we don't, we don't, <laughs> talk, about we don't talk about it. We, we, we no, don't, I just mean that. that's, yeah. that's like, not amongst like our... In, that movie, in the Disney movie, we don't talk about Bruno. But, you know. talk about. Really? I, I meant that's not amongst our most favored hypotheses, but oh, it's certainly God. not that ah. thing we could rule out. <laughs> Got Thanks it. for letting me clarify that. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you very, very much there. But clearly, Venus does have a runaway greenhouse effect. And they're just worried. Maybe it, the, the uh, Venus has knobs that got turned right. that had it become what it is. And we should look at those very same yeah. knobs here on Earth. Yeah, sure no, I mean, a, a serious thing. answer is that by studying what happened to Venus, we can be better prepared to understand changes in Earth's future. And that right. indeed is one of the big motivations for understanding what happened to the climate there. You now, is that is 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 runaway greenhouse effect something that can happen under the conditions that we have, like our planet could undergo the same thing? Could that happen? I'm just saying like not not that we're make that that it is going to happen, but is it possible here? The, uh, people have people have looked at this, and the answer is: if you burned all the fossil fuels on Earth, of course you would make things awful and uninhabitable for humans. But you probably would not trigger a Venus-style runaway greenhouse effect where all the oceans boiled off. I got you. But but in the future, as the sun warms up, which it is slowly in you know a billion years or so, um, then there probably will be a runaway greenhouse effect on Earth, like there was on Venus in the past. So if we wait long enough then the sun will help us do that. So you hear that, Chuck, when an astrophysicist says, in the future, mm -hmm. his next phrase was, a billion, a billion years billion from years. now. <laughs> Always, yes. That, that's some serious ass future that we're talking yeah, about exactly. here. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We, um, we if, have more immediate problems, but uh, nonetheless, it's still in interesting to let picture me add that long-term future. And get David's blessing on this comment before we uh, close it out. So, uh, David, in all my readings on this, I, I agree that if you extracted all fossil fuels and burned them all with none left, the Earth would be hotter, but you would not have the runaway greenhouse effect experienced by Venus. What you would need to do is um, somehow dissolve all of the world's limestone and other repositories of carbon that's beyond just fossil fuels or fossils, right? And, and if you put all of that carbon added to the carbon that the fossil fuel burning would have, then we could become a twin of Venus in that way. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I think that's right. Because then, I mean, Venus has sort of uh, like 100, 100 bars almost of CO2, which is 100 times the atmospheric thickness of Earth. If you burned all the fossil fuels, you're not going to get that much carbon in Earth's atmosphere. But yeah, if you dissolved all the limestone and sort of took all the carbon in Earth's crust and somehow put it in the atmosphere, I don't think anybody should should try this. Yeah. Mind you. <laughs> don't try this at home. Then then I think you probably could turn Earth into Venus. Yeah. OK. Mm. All right. So we're not, we're not doing that for sure. But, but the one thing we know for certain is that greenhouse effect is from carbon in the atmosphere. That is just the well, way carbon it dioxide. is. Carbon, carbon dioxide. dioxide. Yes. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, done deal, greenhouse effect. And we know that we are doing that through burning fossil fuels here right now, right? We're, Absol we're absolutely, we're going in that direction and it's the wrong direction for us. Okay, right. there right. you go. For our survival. All right, All right. Yes. we got to call it quits there on that 
down note. Very, I was going to say. <laughs> I had a, Chuck, I had a good, no, a high note goodnight. a couple of minutes ago, and then you had to just take it down. All right. uh, uh, I wait right. a, a few minutes ago we were abolishing all money and like liberating yes. human creativity. We saved humanity in the last question. Oh, and then man. of course we destroyed it with this one. All right, that's that's, that's that those are the breaks. This is Star Talk Cosmic Query is one of our favorite variants on the Star Talk franchise. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. I want to thank David for coming back to Star Talk. He's a friend of the show. And of course, Chuck Nice. Always good to have you there. Always a pleasure. As always, I bid you to keep looking up. <laughs>